the dog. And that doesn't work. It's impossible. And the reason it's impossible is that there is no regular transformation you can make between any of these two pictures, between two cats and two dogs, and, and try to get them to look the same. There's just no way of doing that. It, it doesn't exist. There is no mathematical transformation. You wouldn't know how to go about it. And people started thinking about this. They realized they can't solve this problem. Then you might say, well, let's just store lots of cats and dogs. We'll have every picture we can ever imagine, everything we've ever seen, every cat or dog. We'll save it all. That is a problem, too. First of all, you can't save that amount of information, not in your head or not in a computer, because it's just way too much. But the second problem is you still have the transformation problem. Because even if you had a million templates of cats and a million templates of dogs, every time you see one, the pattern on your retina is going to be different. You've never had the same pattern on your retina twice in your life. And you still have to make that transformation. And although it seems obvious to do, when you sit down and try to do the math, it doesn't work. And you can't do it. So the question is, how is this done? Clearly, in your head, you have this knowledge. It's stored in there. It's stored in some way. And you've, and you've stored it by looking at cats and dogs over years and seeing them run and play and have fun and do all that kind of stuff and fight and eat. And you can imagine all these things. You can imagine cats and dogs doing these things. It's in your head. And the question we want to answer is, how do you, solve, how do you store that knowledge? How do you collect it? Now, um, in, in 50 years of people working on this problem, they really haven't made much progress until very, very recently. And I'm going to now switch to the present. Uh, and we'll go back to having me on the, on the screen here. I push my button. There we go. Um, in the last few years, a lot of progress has been made on this. Some people have been coming at it from a pure mathematical point of view, some from an engineering point of view, some like myself from a biological point of view, studying neuroscience. And what they all have in common when they get around to the, the best solutions to the knowledge representation problem all involve hierarchical structures, hierarchical memory. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to tell you about it in terms of brains. Because that's the, that's the place we've made the most progress. And brains tell you this. What we want to do is we want to look at the structure of a brain and have it tell us what, is, how it, what does the structure of the brain tell us about memory representation, about knowledge representation. And you don't want to start with like the neuron or the cell. That's too small. You want to start with the large scale structure first and work your way smaller. So we're going to do a little neuroscience now. Uh, but at the end, you're going to understand how brains work. Uh, now, from a computer scientist's point of view, the part of the brain that's most interesting is the neocortex. If you were to open up my head right now, the neocortex is the big wrinkly thing that covers the rest of the brain. It's the most interesting thing because, in, by the way, in a, in a human, it's about 60% of the volume of the brain. Uh, in a human, it's, uh, it basically is the location of all the high-level knowledge that we're interested in. All high-level vision occurs in the neocortex, all visual knowledge. All language is in the neocortex. All high-level somatosensory and motor. All, my language, is, my speech is coming from my neocortex right now. Anything you can tell me verbally is stored in your neocortex, plus a lot of things you can't. It is the organ we're interested in, and it's, it's, it's not the emotional part of the brain or running the heart and all that kind of stuff, but is where knowledge is primarily stored. Now, if we want to look at the neocortex and we take it out of your head, which we could do, it wouldn't be painful because there's no nerve endings in the neocortex. It's a flat sheet of cells, and if you ironed it out, it would look like this dinner napkin. It's about this size, about 1,000 square centimeters and 2 to 3 millimeters thick. It has 30 billion cells. It gets wrinkled up to fit in your head, but if you could iron it flat, it would be about this big. My dinner napkin's talking, yours is listening right now. Seriously. <laughs> Now, what do we know about the structure of this organ? Well, we know that there's different areas of the neocortical sheet, this thin sheet of cells, that do different things. They're different regions. So there's regions that are involved in vision, in language, in motor control, in playing Parcheesi, and so on. There's all these different regions that they've marked out. We know that those regions are connected together at about a 40% connectivity rate. So if region A has about a 40% connectivity chance of being connected to region B. And if region A does connect to region B, that just sends information to it. Region B will always send information back, so they're by, by symmetrically, uh, symmetrically connected. However, they are asymmetric connections, and therefore you can tell which is the feed-forward direction and which is the feedback direction. And if you take about a couple decades of very, very difficult biological work, you can, on any particular species, you can map out all the regions of the neocortex and how they're connected together. And you can make a picture of it. And that's been done for several animals. Now, the picture I'm going to show you next is um, actually very famous in neuroscience. This is a famous picture in neuroscience. It's from the macaque monkey. This is the macaque monkey's neocortex. And, all, and every neuroscientist would recognize this. Probably hardly any of you have ever seen this before. But I'll tell you what it is. It's not that hard to understand. The little boxes in there, the little blue boxes, are regions of the monkey's neocortex. The lines represent how they're connected together. And so when you see a line, it's, it's a bundle of fibers going one way and the other way. 
On the left side of this diagram is the somatosensory motor part of the brain, that is the touch and motor, and on the right side is the visual part. At the bottom of the picture are the sensory organs, so on the left the skin, on the right the retina. And information flows from the retina into a set of these regions in the cortex, and it goes from region to region up and also flows back down. This is the structure that nature uses to store information about the world. Now this is the macaque monkey, but there's a very similar diagram for every mammal species. The human has a similar one, but we can't do it because we can't do the experiments on humans. But it's very similar to this. The macaque monkey's visual system is very good, just about as good as a human's. Now already we can say some interesting things about this. We can say that knowledge is stored um, in, in a hierarchical distribution. That if I ask where in this picture is the, you know, how do we know what a dog looks like or a cat looks like? It's not in any one region. It's distributed across multiple regions. Information has to flow multiple regions here. And these regions contain memory. So memory of that is distributed through this system. We can also say that the system is self-learning. You can't program it. When you're born, no one goes and says, I'm going to store this piece of knowledge here and this piece of knowledge here. All the information comes to the senses. It comes in from the bottom and it flows up. And it flows down. And the regions on their own have to learn on their own what to store. No one can tell them. And the third thing here on the bottom, the last point, is the most amazing point. I say each region is similar. What I mean by that is they look very similar. If you look at any one of these regions of the neocortex, on any mammal species, it doesn't matter, rat or human, it's the same thing. The detailed anatomy in that region, the layers, the cell types, and how they're connected together, is nearly identical. They look nearly identical. And it was speculated in 1979 by Vernon Mountcastle that actually they're all doing the same thing that each region in the neocortex, regardless of what it's connected to, is doing the basic same operation. And what makes a visual region vision is because it's, in the, it's connected to the eyes in the visual hierarchy. And what makes it, you know, an auditory one is because it's connected to sound. This is an amazing discovery. It's all amazing that it took many years for neuroscientists actually to believe it could be true. But it is true, and it's one of the what beautiful discoveries of nature, how it basically uses the same algorithm to solve all these problems. So it makes our job a lot easier. Now one thing is, I'm going to highlight a few regions on here right now. They're just in yellow. And these, someone's phone ringing, that's not me. Um, these uh, yellow regions are the primary regions that are associated with recognizing what visual objects look like. The neuroscientists call it the ventral pathway, the what pathway. So if I want to know where the knowledge about what cats and dogs look like, it's on these yellow regions. And we know that if you look at cells at the bottom of these, at the bottom regions here, close to the retina, they recognize simple things like lines and edges and corners. And when you get to the top, there's cells that represent very complex objects, complete objects anywhere in your visual field. A friend of mine, actually, an alive human, they found cells that respond to Bill Clinton. So when this person sees Bill Clinton in any particular way, any orientation, whatever, that cell lights up. And if this person imagines seeing Bill Clinton, that cell lights up. That's not an exception. You have cells for all kinds of things in your head at the top of the hierarchy. I suppose it's probably a uh, Hillary Clinton cell. Maybe they're close to each other. Who knows? <laughs> now, another thing this diagram doesn't show is the relative areas of these pictures. So now I'm going to show you the same regions. We're, we're going to be doing the, done with the neuroscience here soon. We're going to show you the same regions, but we're going to show you them in their relative area. And we're going to take all the visual regions and just show how big they are. So here's the same things. And the yellow one are, again, the what pathway. And a couple of things jump out at you right away. One, you'll notice that the bottom two regions, with labeled V1 and V2, closest to the retina, very low level information, are huge. In the macaque monkey, they represent 25% of the entire area of the neocortex. And it's something similar to that for you. Basically, 25% of the knowledge of the world that you have is low-level visual information. Not high-level things, not the big picture, these low-level details. And, and you can also see it's sort of a pyramid shape. The, the regions get smaller as you go up the hierarchy. Now, one thing that's misleading about this, you might think this is like a flow chart. Like, OK, we take the image in, we process it, we go to the next step, and so on. And that's not really true. This next picture shows you more what it's like. This shows you that it's really like the bottom region is not like one region. It's like a lot of little regions. And it's more like a, like a tree-shaped hierarchy. And this is how the connectivity shows us what it's like. This is all from biology. I'm not making this up. It's like a tree-shaped hierarchy. We have a lot of little regions at the bottom. They converge, converge, converge as you go up the hierarchy. And unlike this diagram, it doesn't show the information also flows back down. This is nature's data structure for knowledge about the world. This is, the, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like Turing's paper tape. It doesn't look like a digital RAM or anything like that. It's this hierarchical structure. And if we can figure, and by the way, this, this is the visual system, but the very similar hierarchies exist in the auditory and the somatosensory space. This is it. This is the, basically, things like this are narrower, wider, and so on, but they're basically all like this. That's how knowledge is stored in your brain.